Ruth Kinna teaches political thought and theory at Loughborough University in the Midlands region of the United Kingdom. She has published on 19th and early 20th century socialist thought and on contemporary radical political theory, particularly anarchism and the utopianism of prefigurative politics. Kenna has played a major role in legitimating and expanding the academic study of anarchism in recent years. She serves as editor of the journal Anarchist Studies and is editor of the Bloomsbury Companion to Anarchism. She is also the editor of A Beginner's Guide to Anarchism, which is available on the book table outside. And she is currently completing a both length study of Peter Crompkin's political thought, Crompkin reviewing a classical tradition for Edinburgh Pro uh, University Press and working on a project, Anarchism and Non-Domination with Alec Pritchard of Exeter University. Today she will be speaking on slavery and the anarchist rejection of democracy. I work a lot on the boundaries of, of contemporary and, and historical um, anarchism and what I want to do today is to talk about uh, what I think is a shift in, um, in a conception of democracy uh, between contemporary practice and, and historical practice. So the paper itself, um, uh, there's an introduction which, I, which I'll go through in a second, but the, the paper itself is organised in two parts. So in the first part I talk about uh, David Graeber's understanding of, of um, Occupy Wall Street and the Democracy Project. And against that, I look at a conception of, um, of anarchism and slavery, which I think presents a different kind of way of thinking about democracy and the, and the, and the, um, the problems of democracy. Uh, and then I've got a short conclusion at the end. Uh, and there are a few sort of illustrative slides. Uh, but the paper itself is written, and I will read it out, because um, otherwise I just get lost. Okay, so um, to start off with the introduction... Um, I think there's little sustained analysis of democracy in anarchist literatures, uh, but a recent wave of horizontal activism has resulted in the promotion of anarchist practices as models of democratic expression. This conjunction is based on a radical critique of liberal de democratic systems, and it's supported by an organisational distinction between representative bodies which concentrate power in the hands of elites and the decision-making practices of protest movements which are egalitarian, participatory, consensual and direct. Now, the recl reclamation of democracy for anti-capitalist and anti-statist politics, as I say, marks what I think is a significant shift in anarchist activism. Uh, and I think it usefully directs attention to the prevalence of a novel conception of direct action, which resonates with historical anarchist traditions, but importantly, uh, or in important ways, breaks with them. So my aim in this paper is to discuss, discuss the nature of this shift. Uh, and to do so, I resurrect an anarchist critique of slavery, and try and show how this, reframe, how this framed a rejection um, um, of, or a, a different understanding of direct action. And the result really is to disassociate anarchy from democracy, uh, particularly insofar as, as democracy is understood as a process. Uh, and it argues for an approach to protest which reopens a space for the advancement of political demands. Uh, and one of the arguments I want to make is that the, the contemporary framing of anarchism and democracy tends to shut down this space for making demands. Uh, and I think that might be uh, limiting. So the first part of the paper, as I say, looks at, lo looks at this contemporary account of, of anarchy and democracy. Um, the relationship of anarchy to democracy is at the heart of David Graeber's account of Occupy Wall Street. In the Democracy Project, he establishes a historical link between anarchist practices and democratic values in America by tracing a history of resistance politics and self-government from the 18th, 18th century. This analysis explores two paradoxes of capitalist democracy. Uh, the first is the ability of the ruling uh, elite to maintain its power by democratic means. And the second is the comfortable adjustment of anti-democratic property owners to the principle of mob rule in the 19th century uh, and then the 20th. While the first indicates the positive value that electorates attach to liberal democratic regimes, the second highlights the security of the inequalities that the introduction of democracy was expected to undermine. Okay, so um, this is what I think the sort of the, the, the contrast that Graeber is drawing our attention to, um, or how it can be um, illustrated. Graeber, um, argues that, that this, this tension derives from an incompatibility of the idea of democracy with its republican institutionalization. Democracy, he argues, refers to a principle of communal self-governance, 
In classical Greek thought, it was associated with the organisation of popular assemblies and direct engagement in decision making. Republicanism, by contrast, which is at the top, um, describes an idea of good government. So for the founding fathers, Graeber explains, this concept translated into a defence of aristocracy, understood to mean the rule of the best or the wise. In the Republic, sovereignty rested with the people and not the king, but it fell to an educated elite of white men selected by the people to exercise power on its behalf. These men thought themselves wiser and better able to understand the people's true interests than the people themselves. They also happened to enjoy significant economic advantages derived from property ownership. Not only did they use the Republican institutions to cement these advantages, they also used their authority to benefit the speculators who bought up independence war debts, impoverishing ordinary people by the imposition of taxes that were designed to reward the speculator's patriotic entrepreneurial spirit. So Graeber's account of democracy uh, or democracy's ideological corruption focuses on changes in institutional practice. His contention is that democracy's virtues were established during the mid-19th century as a result of populist manipulation of presidential electoral campaigns. This was the point when the principle of equality, trust and openness that Tom Paine had championed during the revolutionary period and which had animated popular grassroots revolutionary politics gave out to an electoral idea based on competition for the popular vote. Graeber establishes the anarchic quality of genuine democracy, so the democracy that was lost, by inference, showing how both terms were, were applied pejoratively to those who protested against the constituted authorities. So democracy was, uh, was used as a, as, a, as a word to tar the reputation of people who supported self-governance, just as anarchy was used as a, um, as a negative term to, uh, to demonise anarchists. And, and this is where he sees the similarity between the two of them. So popular protests in the 18th century against laws that demanded compliance with domination and exploitation were inherently anarchistic, he argues, whether or not the Democrats who participated in these protests would have recognised recognized this correspondence. Okay, now Graeber um, draws three general points um, from his... Um, discussion of, of democracy and the, and the character of, of hierarchical regimes. Um, the first is that democratic traditions can be found in all societies. The Greeks might have coined the idea, but they did not devise the practice or the processes. Democracy has no precise intellectual or cultural root, and instances of democracy can be found throughout history and across the world. The second is that democracy not only treats participants as equals, it also tends towards equality. So Graeber says, democracy in essence is just the belief that humans are fundamentally equal and ought to be allowed to manage their collective affairs in an egalitarian fashion. And given the freedom to do this, he says, democracy is likely to support uh, agreements that provide individuals with the things they need to pursue their goals. So it, it wouldn't necessarily um, result in uniform distributions of goods uh, because people have different wants and needs, uh, but it would tend uh, against uh, the massive um, inequalities that we see in, in our current societies uh, because people would understand through their engagement in democracy that everybody had uh, the same, um, well not right, but everyone would be recognised as someone who deserved or was worthy of resources to pursue their ends. The third general point is that democratisation democratisa can only take place outside the formal institutions of the state. The distinction between the struggle for democracy against the state and the demands for rights from it is the difference between direct and negotiated or permitted action or revolutionary practice and reformism. This anarchistic casting of democracy is demonstrated in two ways. First, by the commitment to adopt prefigurative decision-making practices which counter and expose the hierarchical power structures of liberal democracy. And second, by the refusal to make demands of government. <coughs> Okay, now there's some disagreement um, about the extent to which Occupy Wall Street pursued um, a consistently direct anarchist politics. So Uri Gordon, for example, has questioned Graeber's contention that participants had advanced a steadfast, steadfastly revolutionary challenge to the role of money. And analyzing shifts in the politics of Occupy Wall Street, Gordon argues that the movement blunted the critique of money and corporate capitalism 
even while the protesters adopted what he calls quintessentially anarchistic modes of organizing, um, because while they adopted these anarchistic practices, uh, they appealed to the will of the sovereign people to call for social justice and policy change at elite level. And by issuing this call, they mistakenly legitimized the proxy power government claims, misplacing trust in a right of resistance that liberal democracy defends precisely in order to defeat social transformation and reinforce constitutional myths about the founding of the free and equal society. Okay, now the, the association um, with, re resi res with um, resistance um, and the withdrawal from institutional politics, I think this is the point which marks the shift um, in contemporary anarchism from some key uh, currents in historical anarchism. So, and what I'm trying to say is that while Graeber and Gordon might disagree about the way in which Occupy Wall Street played out, actually they both agree uh, that the revolutionary potential of Occupy Wall Street came in uh, not only in the adoption of a set of processes which they d describe as democratic, but also in this refusal to make demands. Okay, now, less than 50 years ago, Paul Goodman argued that the constitutional myths that Gordon refers to and which habitually secure compliance also have the capacity to exert a transformative power beyond the control of elites who deploy them as constraints Indeed, what he calls these vague and us usually meaningless concepts are useful at critical moments because they drive spectacularly illegal actions. Agreeing that the right of civil disobedience wrongly concedes the warrant of the law, Goodman believed that what protesters actually do in interesting and massive cases is refuse this permission. The warrant of the law is not conceded and the penalties are not agreed to. So by, ex by exercising their sovereignty in direct action, lawless disobedience, in fact, ride roughshod over the institutions which seek to control them. Now, for me, the difference between Goodman and Gordon is not just about how activism is read and represented. Goodman's argument evokes an idea of emancipation that horizontal practice and the anarchistic rendering of democracy tends to downplay. Historical anarchist critiques of democracy offer a similar perspective to Goodman's, and also question the priority that contemporary activists attach to the display of participatory decision-making processes and the detachment of direct action from the advancement of political demands. 19th century anarchists who refused to participate in campaigns for political rights and who struggled for their own emancipation did make demands of government, but precisely in order to highlight the enslavements of the representative systems uh, that constrained them and to inspire action against them. So what I want to do now is just look at what this anarchist critique of, of slavery entailed and how it played out. So the first thing to note really is that the anarchists of the 19th century were operating in a context where autocracy thrived uh, and democratic institutions hardly existed. Even in liberal states, you didn't have democracy. You know, there, was, there was no universal suffrage in, in the UK, uh, not even for men until... Um, whenever it was, I mean, it was after 1867, there was only two thirds of the population could vote of the male population. So you didn't have democratic institutions. And they approached the issue of, de of democracy strategically um, and the anti-constitutional position they pursued was underpinned by a theoretical analysis of the character of the state and capitalism. The principled rejection of electioneering and the extension of the suffrage was based on a view that the rights being claimed supported systems of exploitation and domination that were predicated on slavery. Detaching themselves from prevailing social democratic currents in the international socialist movement, anarchists opened up a critique of citizenship which highlighted the blindness of republican constitutionalism to the social and economic inequalities it sanctioned. Anarchist conceptions of slavery were shaped both by American abolitionist campaigns and the struggle against serfdom in Russia. The enslavement of peoples became a lens to analyze the relationship between government and property ownership and the principles on which freedom in the state was grounded. So the brutal slave systems against the, 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 the abolitionists campaigned against in America uh, for the anarchists illustrated a general principle of enslavement which extended beyond that system. I'm going to talk for, for a little while about Tolstoy, who's a, sometimes called a Christian anarchist. Um, but he, he writes an essay called The Slavery of Our Times, which I think is very interesting. And elaborating this idea, Tolstoy traces the, the origins of the slavery of our times to three sets of laws, those about land, taxes and property. 
And he says, while these pillars of exploitation and inequality remain intact, slavery will continue. Anarchists recognised that formal emancipation significantly changed the lives of slaves and granted important rights that had previously been denied. But the thrust of their critique was that the freeing of slaves was best thought of as a transformation of slavery, not its eradication. The argument that the abolition of slavery in fact concealed a metamorphosis was advanced through a critique of property ownership and the distribution of economic power, which granted individuals the freedom to decide how to dispose of their legitimately owned possessions. So Tolstoy makes the point very graphically about what this means. Um, and he says, even though this is after the abolition of, of or the, uh, after the emancipation of the serfs in, in 1861 in Russia, uh, which was recognised as a complete failure, because basically what happened was that the, formerly the, the serfs were given the land, but they had to buy it, uh, and then they were taxed, uh, you know, quite a proportion of, of what they produced. So, you know, it seemed to, um, to the critics that actually their position had not, had not greatly, uh, greatly improved. And Tolstoy says, even though the slave owner was deprived of slave John, whom he can send down to the cesspool to clear out his excrements, he had money to be a benefactor to anyone of hundreds of Johns, giving him the preference and allowing him, rather than another, to climb down into the cesspool. Voltaire de Clare took up a similar theme, looking at the physical restrictions associated with chattel slavery and, the impris and imprisonment, the restrictions on action resulting from the operation of markets. So and this is what she says, why don't you run when your feet are chained together? Why don't you cry out when a gag is on your lips? Why don't you raise your hands above your head when they are pinned fast to your sides? Why don't you spend thousands of dollars when you haven't got a cent in your pocket? She's drawing a parallel between two sets of conditions. She's not making a moral, um, a moral judgment about which is, which is a better condition to be in. She's just drawing our attention to the fact that there's been a transformation, not an eradication. Yeah, anarchists use slavery as an analytical tool to dissect state oppression and press the argument about slavery's transformation to investigate the different ways in which domination affect groups within states. One conclusion they draw, drew from this analysis was that slavery did not reduce to class oppression. Distinguishing between political and economic slavery, Kropotkin argued that the former would last for as long as the latter existed, Yet denying that one was mother to the other, he also denied that political change, which he defined as liberation from religious and intellectual servitude, would follow automatically once man is freed from poverty. It was possible to imagine that the abolition of capitalism would leave non-class prejudices and forms of domination intact. And looking at Russia, he was particularly concerned to highlight the aggressive imposition of religious orthodoxy and the Russian language on diverse national, by which he meant indigenous and faith groups. According to Clark and Martin, Elise Reclus was also well aware of the fact that the abolition of slavery did not eliminate the system of racism and the exploitation of black people in America. After the so-called emancipation, Reclus described the exploitation of freed labour power of former slaves as slavery minus the obligation to care for children and the elderly. The continued existence of supremacist cultures meant that ex-slaves were not merely exploited as workers, but in particular ways as black workers through the operation of segregation policies and the differential rights that freed slaves were recorded as citizens, which blinded everybody then to their, to their inequalities because the citizen was of course equal before the law. The second, formally, the second conclusion that anarchists drew from this analysis of slavery was that these multiple forms of enslavement were cemented in law. De Clare's analysis of sex slavery described the particular <coughs> enslavements of women. Marriage was the cornerstone of this form, form of domination, advanced by the church and protected by the state. It affected all women, whether or not they were married, supporting the denigration of sex workers, the shaming of unmarried mothers, and the bastardising of their children. In marriage, sex slavery was legalised rape. Out of marriage, it sanctioned the same, but as a matter of fact. Every married woman, de Clare argued, is a bonded slave who takes her master's name, her master's bread, her master's commands, and serves her master's passion, who passes through the ordeal of pregnancy and the throes of travail at his dictation, not at her desire, who can control no property, not even her own body, without his consent, and from whose straining arms the children she bears may be torn at his pleasure or willed away while they are yet unborn. 
The recognition that constitutional states cemented multiple systems of domination, enslaving individuals deemed equal before the law in different ways, encouraged anarchists to focus attention on the commonalities across states rather than the differences between them. Anarchists appreciated the disparities between autocracy and liberalism, not least those who were seeking asylum in liberal states. But the analysis of slavery not only complicated the idea of class in anarchist thought, it provided a set of comparators for the conceptualization of the state that the discussion of government institutions bypassed. Anarchist sens sensitivities to the similarities of states thus sharpened the critical analysis of democratization. So I think 19th century anarchists would have agreed with David Graeber that 18th century elites um, simply obliged people to, to, to obey laws um, over which they had no real control and over which the aristocracy presided, the elite presided, and that there was a resemblance between that system um, and the monarchical uh, system that it replaced. But from their historical vantage point, democracy was only another regulatory system. Equally, Horizontalism and self-government were integral to anarchist organisation, but they were not themselves the means to tackle the fundamental changes associated with the introduction of wage labour, the codification of law, and the stabilisation of hierarchy. The anarchist critique of slavery did not make individual anarchists especially sensitive to forms of domination that the critique explored. So there were plenty of anti-Semites, people who were blind to, to racism and, and, and anti-feminists within the anarchist movement. Um, nor did anarchists always apply the critique evenly in, the, in, the, in looking at the character of slavery. So there were plenty of people who talked about slavery but didn't see it in particular uh, in the condition of particular groups. Nevertheless, the rejection of slavery played an important part in anarchist direct action. Anarchists argued that the attempt to win power in the state and wield it as a tool to ab abolish capitalism was nonsensical as a means of securing the state's abolition because domination and slavery would remain. Moreover, because enslavement did not reduce to an idea of class exploitation, it was impossible to imagine how the achievement of classlessness would resolve non-class oppressions. Anarchists adopted direct action to fight against domination and exploitation, and in order to encourage slaves, and in, and in order, precisely in order to encourage slaves to fight against their enslavements, in whatever realm uh, they sought emancipation. So this might involve individual or collective action, or a mixture of the two. But the point was, it entailed willful disobedience as a counter to slavery and slavishness. So. I'm just going to conclude now, but, but what I've tried to do is to, to set up a different way of, of thinking about um, what democracy is doing. Uh, democracy is not a process, or not just a process through which you can organise uh, decision making. Democracy is actually part of the problem from this point of view. The anarchist rejection of slavery challenges the priority that attaches to the demonstration of horizontal democracy. Non-hierarchical organising has always been a central part of anarchist activism, but the adoption of anarchist pra anarchistic practices was designed to support and sustain rebellious direct action, not to separately encapsulate a set of values or demonstrate a behavioural capacity. In a political context where democracy is so well established as a political virtue, its rejection in favour of anarchy may well be self-defeating. However, the conflation of anarchy with democracy and the attention given to demonstrating the competence for self-government risks diminishing the idea of resistance to government and the rejection of slavery and slavishness achieved either by disobedient demand uh, for rights or by their lawless disregard. While the struggle against slavery challenges the principle of rights on which political citizenship depends, and as Gordon argues, it rules against demands made in the name of citizenship, it does not disallow demands that individuals or groups might press as rebellious slaves. A long-standing principle of syndicalist action is that workers advance demands for incremental change as workers, not as would-be electors. Direct action for the reduction of in work time or improvements in conditions is qualitatively different from political action designed to achieve the same ends. As Martha Acklesberg argues, when 19th century US workers advanced their political demands to organize as citizens, they not only compromised the campaigns they might have waged uh, as workers, but they also um, uh, compromised the, uh, the ways in which other um, groups of people who were not organized in their uh, unions could also fight. Um, I just want to end with 
one quote to illustrate what I think is the sort of the essence of the um, of the the rejection of slavery argument, and it's an argument that comes from from Emma Goldman. And what she's saying is that you know to to to, to advance an anarchist demand doesn't mean to say that you don't make clear what your demands are. It means that you advance them in particular ways. Um, and and I think th for me this encapsulates the whole thing. Ask for work. If they don't give you work, ask for bread. If they do not give you work or bread, then take bread. Okay, thank you. <laughs>